There we go. Okay, so for the factor opinion one, uh, you can just go ahead and put like number one and then just say factor opinion and then give me the the kind of explanation why. The explanation doesn't have to be super long. Uh, just a sentence works. Uh, you know, you can measure it. You can, uh, if it's a fact, you know, it can be measured. Uh, you can look at it to see that it's true. You can, you know, it's a measurable fact or it's a measurable or it's, um, you can look at the data. If it's opinion, you just say, you know, somebody else could disagree or uh, you, it's not statistically provable. It's, you know, that kind of thing. So it, it doesn't have to be, you know, a paragraph or, um, um, it doesn't have to be long-winded. How about that? <clears throat> I'm just looking for understanding because I think it's important. Okay, so uh, are there any questions about anything? Uh, are we good or no? Uh, I mean, you can, you can have questions and be good, I guess. It's perfectly fine to have a question. I, it actually gives me uh, something to talk about that I don't have to come up with on my own. <clears throat> at, at medium ish, I'm not trying to make this a multi page paper. So the question was for part one of the assignment, which is um, uh, listing the six uh, symptoms of groupthink. Uh, again, you don't have to give me, you know, four pages. What I would like is I would like, just tell me the, the, the symptom, uh, give me a, a, an example of that symptom, kind of a real world example, and then uh, tell me how it can be avoided or how we can try to avoid it. Most of the group think problems are just inherent in a group and we have to kind of active because those are the, the, Did my audio cut out? No, okay, it's just for you, Oscar. <clears throat> so the dynamics of groups funnel things towards the groupthink symptoms, the symptoms of groupthink. That's a natural progression. And so what we try to do is we try, we should try to be aware that those things can happen and how can we try to avoid it? Like I said, you can't be a hundred percent on this, but, uh, and so I think I gave you examples and, and you should be able to find examples online. Um, all you gotta do is give me like one. You don't have to, you know, tell me like 15 things for each one. Um, again, it's to get you to actually think about it and, and writing it down uh, focuses uh, our thought processes. So you should be able to do each one in three or four sentences. So there's a list of six and you don't have to do it in paragraph form. You can just kind of list it and then just give me a couple of sentences. Uh, anything else, uh, anything else that we want to clarify or you want me to clarify? No. Okay, yeah, go ahead. Oh, you need to unmute yourself, otherwise I can't hear you. Uh, Patrick, you're still muted. There you go. The space bar is supposed to function. Now, for some reason, this computer, when I hit the space bar, it does all kinds of bizarre things in Zoom. And yeah, no, I, I see it's, it's changing your picture. Yeah, I'll, I'll fix that in a minute. Yeah. Um, the, uh, I, from going through the lecture that I was, that I had listened to, mm -hmm. seems like there may have been more than six items. We talked about more, I mean, there were six symptoms. Um, I'm pretty sure that in the, oh, I forget which lecture it is. Oh, in, in the lab, I think I went over the six. So I think the lab lecture for that, the day that I assigned it, uh, goes over the six. And I'm pretty sure that the day we, the, the lecture, so there was the lab 
that I have recorded that I'm, when I assign it, I think I mentioned all six of them. And okay. the lab where we talked about groupthink, I think there may have been two lectures, I'm sorry, the two lectures where we talked about groupthink, I'm pretty sure I mentioned them there also. Um, what are they? I can, where are they? Uh, one of them's peer pressure, right? Uh, all my, my, my wife cleaned up my room. So now I can't find anything. <laughs> Hold on, let me see what they are. They're here somewhere. We talked about critical skills. Oh, uh, uh, and I'm trying to find where they are. Yeah, of course, the page that I'm looking for isn't there. It's the next page. and. It, it isn't in the in my list here. Hold on, where are they? This is what happens when other people clean up for you. Those are my brain teasers. Oh, here we are. <clears throat> Phantom. So it's rationalization, peer pressure, complacency, high moral ground, stereotyping, and the illusion of uh, unanimity. Those were the six. And I'm sure that there are more, when we talk about group dynamics, that there are more symptoms of this. But the yeah, go ahead. Could you read that back one time a little slower? Because I have a list here, and I'm trying to figure out if I missed some or have the wrong ones. So the first one is rationalization. Got it. Peer pressure. Got it. Complacency. Okay, complacency. Yeah, that's, that's the one where a group feels like their decisions are fine because there's no disagreement. Okay. And then we have moral high ground. Got it. Stereotyping. Got it. And lastly, the illusion of unanimity, which is kind of like um, the complacency one. So discourage discussion of new ideas. Well, the illusion of, of unanimity basically has to do with, because no one is speaking out against it, the group feels like everyone is in agreement. Okay, so, so some on my list may be subcomponents of the six. Okay. Possibly, that, that, yeah. That's what's going on. Okay, yeah, thank okay. you. You're welcome. Okay, so today, <laughs> I looked up at this clock and it says 1035. So that's wrong. I was like, oh, how did time fly that quickly? <clears throat> so today I want to start talking about uh, programming and problem solving. <clears throat> and so computational problem solving, maybe. We'll get there at some point this week. <clears throat> so what is, I'm going to ask you guys questions. What, is, what do you think programming is? <laughs> Robert is like one rationalization. Robert says it's hard. Um, not necessarily. <clears throat> Giving instructions to a computer. Creating programs. Go ahead, Patrick. Spacebar still doesn't work. Anyway, yeah, um, um, it is a it is a sequence, a logical sequence of events to to take data and turn it into a finished product. Okay, so that's closer to the the computer science way of thinking. Uh, in my way of thinking, and thank you all for playing, by the way, solving problems with computers, telling the electric box to do smart things. Um, Programming is basically creating a piece of software, creating 
a program. And so <clears throat> now we're going to be creating programs that are a little bit esoteric um, and not kind of real worldy because we're trying to learn how to actually write code and how to look at issues and try to solve them. So uh, in our case, it's a little bit abstract, but if we think of it in general, when I say that programming is writing a program or creating a program, we have to define what a program is. So there are many different kinds of programs, but most of the programs that we use are what we call application programs. And so before you start to create a program, before you start um, you know, writing code, programming consists of other things. And so what's the first thing that we need to know in order to, uh, before we start creating a program? What do we need to understand or know? Go ahead. The, uh, you, need, you need to know what you need, your end product. You need to know what problem you're trying to solve. Yeah. So, um, Nellis said um, what the program is going to do. So what, what we need the program to do, basically, and that's what you said too, Patrick, just in different words. Um, so <clears throat> we can't create something unless we know what it needs to do, right? What is, what is the function of the program going to be? You can't create a program, and I use Word as an example a lot. Um, you can't create Word unless you know, <laughs> right, what the end product should be. So if we think about creating a word processing program, and by the way, I, I use Word a lot as an example just because I assume that everybody has, um, has used it uh, or that we've all, we're familiar with it. <coughs> And the tricky bit is what does Word do? You can, you can give me this in like one sentence. What does Word do? What does it do for us? What is the application that we use Word for? Word, Patrick, Word does not have a programming language embedded in it. It is created using a programming language. So it actually, how do I put this? It's, yeah, I think I put it well the first time. It's created using a program language, programming language. We use it to create documents. But what does that mean? That's not a, I mean, Peter, it is a, it's a good answer and, and it's a jumping off point from what I want to talk about in, in, you played the game correctly. <laughs> so, so, but when we look at creating a program, we have to not only look at the broad kind of picture, which we tend to do. So when I, when, when I ask you, what does Word let us do? And you say, uh, word processing, uh, create documents, um, write stuff. Uh, I've, yes, I've go ahead, Valerie. Idea. So, you know, everything's right, of course, but if we're going to look at the meat of this, it um, allows it for if you were, you know, writing a letter or something important to transcribe our words and to share for communication for these important, you know, um, documents. So basically, it transcribes your words and it allows us to share it with people around the world for you know any sort of reason so as a communication tool valerie you're so idealistic i love that <laughs> i'm much more realistic um it's basically a glorified typewriter is what it is 
Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> See, I'm I'm much less uh, I'm much more cynical. Um, <clears throat> but we're still looking at big picture, right? Even when I say it's a glorified typewriter, it's still big picture, right? What does Word let us do? Be a lot more specific. And I'll explain why we need to think this way in a minute. It turns your keystrokes into letters. Okay. So now uh, Stephen has boiled it down to its total minimalist um, function. But <laughs> let's go up just one half step above that. To write things down in any format or any any way, shape, or form you want to. What does Word let us? What does let? What does it let us do? Come on, you've all done all kinds of stuff in Word. What is it? What are some of the things that we can do in Word? You can create documents. You can write. Yes, we got it. But those are still very general, right? I can take a piece of paper and a pencil, and I can write. So that's not unique to Word. Make a chart. Of course, we don't want to talk about, yes, we can make, we can do spell checks. Yes. What else? We can change the font. Thank you. We can, we can format stuff. We can change the color. We can make things bold. Yes, now we're getting it. We can change the font size, right? All of those things are actions that, that the program, okay, we, can, we, got it. we got it now, add images. Um, we can center text, right? Now that, now that we've got the hint, right, of where I was trying to go, everybody's like, oh, and you can have one or two columns, so, <laughs> or three. Or, we can have multiple columns. My point here is that in order to create Word that we see kind of as a whole, at some point somebody had to come down. So let's say that we have no word processor. We want to create a piece of software. And typically, by the way, large pieces of software and I and comp or complicated pieces of software like Word are not created by one person. They're created by a group of people. And they're created not by just a group of people, they're created by groups of people that are focusing on different aspects of the program. <clears throat> but at the very beginning, somebody had to say, you know what, we should create a program that lets people create text documents, a word processor because right now all we have is a typewriter to do that. And that's, so we should be able to use the computer because it has a keyboard and we should be able to type on it and we should be able to save that information and create files. And then the discussion had to go something like, well, what should, what should it be able to do? And somebody had to come up with, and I always go back to the very simple things, well, we should be able to underline text. Okay, we'll write that down. Underlining text. Because remember, I have nothing. And nobody has, has sat at a computer and tried to code or write any, you know, use a programming language at all. Before any of that happened, somebody had to say, ooh, ooh, I'm Patrick. Ooh, 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 ooh. Um, Maybe we should be able to uh, change the font color of text. Okay, we'll write that down. Change font color of text. And make stuff italicized, you know, make the letters lean. Because that's important. What would we do without it? Um, make things bold, another thing very important. Um, change the font size. Change the alignment of the text. Okay, but that's a little bit vague. What kind of alignments do we want? Oh, well, we should be able to left align because that's kind of normal, but we want to center stuff. And maybe we need to right align stuff on, on the other side. 
So the process of just coming up with what the program should do takes forever. Well, it doesn't take forever. There is a finite amount of time. And at some point, because that it can go on forever, right? You could just keep adding stuff. And then the process of, of trying to figure out what the program is going to be able to do takes forever. So at some point we have to go, okay, that's enough. <clears throat> so the step after that is then to figure out, well, how are we going to implement it? What should it look like? And unfortunately in Python, we don't have the user interface, the easy user interface capabilities that we did when we, when I used to teach this kind of a class with Visual Basic. Um, so we're not going to be focusing on uh, or, or doing much of user interface because it's always, it's going to be command line. But uh, typically is how are we going, so how is the user going to say make something bold? <clears throat> and, you know, making something bold, italicize, underline, right? Those are different, there, there's a way to, to, to do those three things. But changing the font type is different. Even changing the color is a different kind of a, a way that that is implemented. So with the bold italicize and underline, it's a button that you can toggle, right? You click on it and it's, you type and it's bold and, or you highlight something and you click on bold, it's bold. If you click it again, it's not bold. So it's a button that toggles. So somebody had to say, hey, we're gonna have a button that toggles stuff. Um, <clears throat> whereas with the font color or the font size, it's a drop down menu. You click on it and then you get a list of numbers and you can pick one, right? So there's different ways that each thing that Word can do are implemented. A group of people had to sit down and think about that and design the user interface. After that, <laughs> once somebody said, okay, these are the things we wanted to do, and we're going to implement them this way, or we're going to try to implement each one of them in a certain way. So we're going to use a, a, a graphic button, or we're going to use a menu, or we're going to use a keyboard shortcut. What's the keyboard shortcut for making stuff bold? Anybody know? Ah, control B. Good. <clears throat> so then somebody has to say, okay, so what's the appropriate programming language that will let us do what we want to do? Because there are many different programming languages and some of them are, are uh, better at doing certain kinds of, creating certain kinds of programs, doing certain kinds of things. Uh, so for instance, uh, Word is created using a programming language called C++ or C++. Well, I, you know what? I'm not actually 100% sure what they're using now. Because as time goes on, programming languages get modified. And it used to be C. C became C++ and that became C++ as it moved into, uh, uh, it, it added different capabilities. <clears throat> and so uh, I'm not sure what they're writing it in now. I'm not, what, what I'm not sure about is what it was written in originally, um, whether it was C plus or C. I'm, I'm sure that now they work on it in C plus plus because that's the more when they do updates. The other thing about a program like Word is that it's become much more complicated over time. As new versions come out, Microsoft keeps adding new capabilities. So Word in the beginning wasn't as powerful as it is now or as multifaceted as it is now. Uh, I remember that uh, the, when you inserted an image in my first version of Word, that was pretty much all you could do. You could resize the image and you could move it around, but you really couldn't do much Im image editing. Now in Word, you can do all kinds of stuff to the image itself. 
it's almost like a mini uh, image editing program. You can crop it, you can get rid of backgrounds, you can do all kinds of stuff um, with images in Word, even though it's a, its focus is word processing, so doing things to, to text and words, um, it's become a bit of a uh, photo editor. It's not a very powerful one, but it can do a whole lot. So um, as time goes on, programs evolve, and the natural state of program evolution is for the program to become more complex, right? We, we like it's never, it would never happen in Word that they'd go, um, you know, we can do up to four columns on a page but nobody really uses that. So let's get rid of being able to do three or four columns. Let's just do one or two columns. So let's get rid of a feature. That very rarely happens uh, because the natural tendency is to go to add more features, not less, not take features that exist away. That should make sense to everybody. So, Simple programs typically over time get more complicated. I can use um, like the Mazda Miata. When it came out in like 90-ish, it was supposedly a throwback little two-seater car that was very basic, it was a manual stick, two-door convertible, didn't have a bunch of frills, and was kind of a throwback to the 60s English kind of MGs and stuff like that. Over time, it, like if you compare the first Miata to a Miata now, the Miata now is <laughs> light years more complicated and has many, many, it has navigation, it's got all kinds, it's got you press the button, the top comes up, right, and goes down. Um, over time, as it's been modified, it's become more complex. It's become a, a even a bigger car. Um, what's the thing that always makes me laugh is, is the Mini Cooper. When the Mini Cooper came out, it was a throwback to the 60s Cooper. It was supposed to be a small two-door car. And in a very few short period of time, a couple of years, they made it a four-door and made it a lot bigger because people complained it was too small. But the whole point was we're going to make a really small car. That's still kind of practical. And so now there's a guy down the street that has three of them and they're the clubmen or whatever they're called. And so they're kind of half wagons, they're four doors, and they're as, as, almost as big as my car. So over time, it got more features right? It, it, it morphed from what it was at the beginning. So a, a lot of times, Miata less than three. I'm confused. Uh, yeah, the, the original Honda Civic and the 2020 Civic, you know, it's twice as heavy. It gets more stuff. So programs are the same way. They get more stuff over time um, and they become bloated and they slow down our damn computers and they don't work the way they're supposed to. Although Word is still pretty, it's okay. But it, it, it's, um, <laughs> if you looked at the first word processors, WordPerfect uh, was the first mainstream word processor. If you look at that, the first versions of that program to today's versions of, I think WordPerfect is actually still around, but uh, today's versions of Word uh, if, you know, the, the capabilities are light years uh, more advanced. <clears throat> so where was I going with this? Oh, so then we figure out <laughs> what program, programming language is most appropriate. And then we start programming. So there's a lot of stuff to do before we ever program anything. And by the way, then before we actually start programming, somebody has to sit down. Oh yeah, that's right. Word, uh, before we had PCs, uh, word processing machines or dedicated devices, because we didn't have uh, software 
as we know it today. Software was um, hardwired into the device. So you couldn't upgrade or you couldn't remove it. It was part of the device. <coughs> but anyway. What was I going to say? What was I saying? The phone rang and then my brain went, somebody calling? What time is it? <clears throat> what was I saying? I was saying that, um, oh, before we even start programming, we need to look at um, how we're going to implement something. So the tricky part of programming is not actually learning the programming language, although that can be tricky and difficult. But the hard part is training our brains to think in minute details, breaking a complex or a whole into its individual bits and pieces. So even when I say something like, well, we're going to use a button and the user is going to click that button to make things bold. And if they don't want it to be bold, they can click on it and it won't be bold. Even that's too complicated. We have to break that down into its individual pieces. So when you make something bold, there are two general ways in Word to do it. What are they? Does anybody know what they are? And, and don't give me keyboard shortcut and press the button. That's not what I'm looking for. I'm looking for the process that we go through in order to make something bold. So there's two processes. I don't care how we use it. Like I said, I don't care whether it's the button or whether it's the keyboard shortcut. It doesn't matter. There's a process that we have to go through that leads up to pushing the button or using the keyboard shortcut. Okay. Yes, you got it. So the first thing that we have to do is, and you guys came up with one of the ways to make stuff bold you highlight or select the text that you want to modify. And by the way, it's not just making stuff bold, it's formatting pretty much anything in your document, right? So one way is I take the text, I highlight it however you want to, and then you press the bold button and it becomes bold. What's the other way? And like I said, it has nothing to do with the keyboard shortcut or right clicking. Yes, Logan got it, and so did Tatiana. You click the bold button, and then you start typing. And whatever you type is bold from that point on. <clears throat> so there, there's a, there are two fundamental ways, and it doesn't just apply to bold. It applies to all formatting in Word. That's where we need to start. So we're going to highlight the text. We have to be able to select the text first, and then I need to have the code apply whatever it is that we're doing, whatever formatting we're doing to it, to that text. Or I need to enable the formatting and then type the text. So that has to do with how we are going to, or how do I put this? It's kind of the algorithm that we use for, well, it's, it's actually before we even get to algorithms. It has to do with the implementation of whatever feature that we want the program to be able to do. And so that's a very basic kind of a concept. Again, 
it's kind of the hard part of uh, learning to program. It's trying to get your brain to th break things down into its very, 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 very simple steps. And then try to put those steps in a logical progression that a computer or that a programming language can then let us create code for so that it actually does what it's supposed to do. So <clears throat> one of the hardest bits is trying to figure out how we're going to have the program do whatever it is that we need to, it to do. And so that's in the book, it's called, well, it's not just in the book, but that's called computational problem solving. And by the way, I am in chapter one-ish. Um, he doesn't talk about word at all, but um, those are the kind of concepts that I'm covering. So computational problem solving basically um, has to do with how we can use a computer to solve a particular problem or to fulfill a particular uh, function, to do a particular function, to do something. So, the book uses this example. Uh, it's widely used as an example. And it's the man, cabbage, goat, and wolf problem. It's actually pretty good. I keep, I always click the wrong damn thing. So what we have is we have, where'd all my pens go? See, my wife cleaned up. Where are all my, where did everything go? It's behind the computer so you can't see it. There we go. I, I need my little pen. So basically what we have is we have a river. And then on one side of the river, we have a man, a cabbage, a goat, and a wolf. Is anybody familiar with this problem? And not because you read our book, but just kind of in general? <laughs> no, nobody's ever heard this one before, before the book, Patrick has. No, okay. So what we're gonna try to do is we have a, I'm looking, I still, no, okay. So what we have is we have a man who has a boat. Okay, so we also have a boat. And he's got to get all three of these things, plus himself, to the other side of the river. Yeah. And Sergio, you might remember this. Now, the problem is, and we have to define how this is gonna happen. He just can't put everybody on the boat and take them over. The boat's not big enough. <clears throat> so it can only hold himself plus one of the, one of the three things. So the problem is he can't leave the goat alone with the cabbage because the goat is going to eat the cabbage if left alone with the cabbage. And he can't leave the wolf alone with the goat because the wolf will eat the goat if left alone. And he's got to try to get all three of these things over to the other side. So you can see that here we have kind of a logic problem. We know that there's a solution What it is, I don't know. But the easiest way to figure it out, well, not the easiest way, but one way to figure it out would be to use what we call the brute force approach. And basically the brute force approach, we just try all of the possible combinations.
yeah, see, it's early. <laughs> Angelina's like, oh, I need more coffee. Yeah, this is what it's going to be kind of like from now on. So drink up. I do. I'm on my third cup. Um, so what can the man take over? So he can, we can take into the boat, we can put the cabbage, and we can move the cabbage to the other side, but damn it, now I only have a wolf left on the other side. So that doesn't work. <clears throat> I'll do the wolf. I can put the wolf on the boat and schlep it to the other side, but damn it, throw the wolf into the river is not a option because I, the, it will drown and it won't get to the other side. So we're trying to get all three over here or, or all four of us over to the other side. So I can take the goat over because the wolf isn't going to eat the cabbage. So I take the goat across, right? Because that seems, no, the wolf will not eat the man. The man has a, has a big club. No, it's a, the wolf, let's just say it's like a, a big wolfy dog. It just doesn't play well with goats. So if I take the goat across, then I have the cabbage and the wolf alone on the other side. So now I have this, right? So again, I'm using the brute force kind of um, method to see what I should do next and if it will work. So what can the man do next? The man can go back across and he can bring the cabbage over. Sergio, I already told you that you only have room for two things on the boat. So you can't move them all at once. You will sink and all drown and you'd be dead. Sergio's dead, he's no longer playing, he drowned. Um, so I can come across and I can bring the cabbage over. And then go back across, but then my cabbage gets eaten, right? So that's not gonna work. So I can bring the wolf across. I only have two things left over here and then go back. But what happens is the goat gets eaten. So that's not gonna work. So it seems like there's no, there's no solution. Right? Well, there is one. I don't know what W equals C means, Patrick. Oh, wolf and cabbage. <clears throat> yeah, so at some point we have to get the wolf and the cabbage to the other side. So if I carry the wolf across first, right? So let's, let, let's see if I can undo to where we don't, I don't know what I marked. There we go. So let's try not carrying the, the goat across first. Let's try carrying the wolf across first. So I'll bring the wolf over here and then I go back and I can grab the cabbage. Oh no, I'm done, right? Because while I was over here on the, the other side of the river, the goat ate the cabbage. So I'm screwed again. So this is actually fairly simple. Um, it's just that we need to reconsider the assumptions that I that we made, the inherent assumption that we have. Now, what's the inherent assumption that I've been working under? You have to get them all over to one side without bringing one of them back. Exactly. The assumption that I made was I can't bring one of them back. Right? But I can. The, nowhere in the problem did it state that you can't ferry stuff back and forth. So 
I'm going to start off with the goat. So I'll bring the goat over here. And then I'll go back across and I'll grab the wolf and put the wolf over here. But I'm going to grab the goat and move the goat back to the left side. Then I'm going to grab the cabbage and move the cabbage over here. And then I'll go back and grab the goat. And then all four of us will be on this side. So the goat won't eat the cabbage and the wolf won't eat the goat. Now look how simple that became as soon as we changed the assumption that we were working under. And like I said, we tend to do this in our daily lives. We tend to have, and by the way, a lot of brain teasers, a lot of puzzles, a lot of um, riddles, use that kind of inherent assumption that our brain makes or that we make as human beings and that our brain is prone to make in order to stump us. So as soon as Angelina said that the assumption was that I can't bring stuff back once it's across, well shit, it doesn't say that I can't do that. Nowhere did he say that he couldn't do that. Then all of a sudden it became easy, right? It's not that hard of a problem. I bring the cabbage across, uh, I bring the goat across, the wolf and the cabbage are fine together. Then I come back, the goat's by itself. So I grab, and by the way, I can do either one. I can grab the wolf, ferry the wolf across. I can grab the goat, bring him back over here. And then I can grab the cabbage, bring it to the wolf. Now we have wolf, cabbage, goat. So nobody's eating each other. And then I can go back, grab the cabbage, uh, grab the goat and, and come back over to the other side. And I have fulfilled the, uh, the, the, I've solved the problem. Or the man could go to one side by himself, let the goat eat the cabbage and then the wolf eat the goat get on his computer, get on Amazon, order a new cabbage, a new wolf, and a new goat, and have it delivered by tomorrow with expedited shipping. <laughs> That's the modern world. That's how that works nowadays. <laughs> Screw it, you can even sink the boat when you're on the other side and order a new boat. <laughs> ship them in separate, but yeah, Amazon will ship them separately. <laughs> Patrick's like, oh, yeah, Amazon will ship them separately. Just call Amazon or get online, get, get Amazon to send you a bigger boat with, um, with three different rooms that you can put your animals into. Okay, so <laughs> that's kind of the essence of, so I tried the brute force approach. I just started willy-nilly trying to, to move stuff across and see if it worked. I didn't try to apply any logic to it, but I very quickly found that when I was trying my brute force approach that it didn't work, right? It took me a couple of, I move this over here, move that over, no, that, that doesn't work, then move it, move it. Okay, and then I said, hey, you know what? If I can move stuff back, then my brute force approach and my inherent logic makes the problem a little bit simpler to do. We can't always use a brute force approach because some problems have too many combinations, too many things to look at and would take a computer too long to do. So one thing that I found very interesting is that, um, and I know that we're running out of time, but um, one thing I found very interesting is that there are years ago and even now looking at it again uh, that there's there's a limit to what a computer can really do and we are so used to computers being very fast and we're spoiled we have modern very very fast computers but there are still problems that are very difficult 
for a computer to solve just because there are so many possibilities. So the book talks about trying to figure out how to find the shortest route of travel for a salesman needing to visit a certain amount of cities. So there's a given amount of cities. And we have to find the shortest route for him to travel or her to travel from one place to the next so that overall it's the shortest distance. And by the way, UPS does this every day. Um, <clears throat> So if we only have 10 cities, which doesn't seem like a lot, <laughs> it, there's a factorial of 10, which means that there are over uh, three and a half million. It's more like 3,600,000 different combinations that you've come up with. And if we use a brute force approach to attack this problem, it's gonna take a long time. And by the way, if you have 20 cities, um, there's, half a quintillion different combinations that you could put, you, you need to analyze. Half a quintillion. That's a lot, crap load of numbers. And if a computer could compute one million routes per second, it takes 77,000 years to find the answer, to go through half a quintillion different ones. And that's, it's doing how many a second? A million routes a second. So you can see that there's a limit to what a computer can actually do. And, and this isn't like, you know, I'm not doing quantum physics. I'm not doing some kind of trying to track all of the atoms in, the, in a nuclear reaction or whatever in the sun. Um, this is something I'm trying to find the shortest route. Uh, that a salesman should take between 20 cities. And if I use the brute force approach, which basically means I just randomly pick one route here, one route there, right? I randomly connect them and measure the distances. And I don't duplicate any of them. And I try to find out, yeah, quantum computers can do that even faster. They could probably cut it down to, um, 30,000 years or so. Uh, so that's, that's a huge help. <laughs> um, <laughs> or hell, if they can, if we could really, we're really fast, it only takes a thousand years to figure it out for a computer to figure it out. So when, when we're looking at uh, how to solve problems using a computer, the brute force approach is not always the best one. Just because it becomes super inefficient. In order to realize, and this is my last thought, I'm sorry, I'm a little late. In order to realize that the computer can't do it, we have to know something about the problem. And so, if I say to you, we have 20 cities, we even I naturally don't think that that's a lot, right? 20 is not a lot. It shouldn't be that hard to solve. So what we needed to understand is how to figure out how many possibilities there were. And by the way, a rough estimate would have been enough. So we needed to know enough math to figure out that I have Oh crap, that's gonna be like a quintillion or that's gonna be a hundred million possibilities. That's gonna be, right? That's gonna be a lot. We have to have a rough guesstimate. Like if I go one quintillion or two quintillions, that's double, but that's close enough for me to figure out that that's a crap load, right? And that lets me figure out, well, okay, so if I do a thousand roots analyzations per second, That's going to take, um, the world won't exist and we'll be still be looking for the answer, <laughs> right? The sun will have exploded, um, it, but the computer will still be working on it. That's obviously not a practical way to do it. 
So we have to try to find some alternatives. So we will talk about some alternatives. We will, uh, by the way, there is lab today. I will lecture a little bit and we'll talk about installing uh, Python and any issues that you might have. So there will be lab today. And Logan made a program to go through 64 factorial combinations. As soon as I pressed it, pressed run, it just froze. Yeah, that's because your computer's going, I'm sorry. I can't help you. Um, <laughs> I'm just going to take a break. It's too hard. Um, so uh, I will see you guys. Is there any questions? Um, read chapter one or look at chapter one. It's, it's actually a good idea. And let me do this. It's a good idea to read the chapters. Uh, we are going to get very complicated very quickly. So it's a good idea to read the chapters. And I apologize for, for I'm not going to make you read, but it's in your own best interest to read. So, um, yeah, it gets very complicated, and we're going to talk about a lot of stuff very quickly. And I know up to now I've been lulling you to sleep, but I'm gonna, we're going to have to kick it into a, another gear here because the book does cover a lot of information. Yeah, he goes very quickly. And so I'm going to try to be slow in chapters one and two, but um, uh, we're going to go faster and faster. So having said that, it's, it's an opportunity for you to read um, computer science stuff, which is super exciting. So I will, uh, if you have any questions, I'll stick around. If you don't, I will see you uh, during lab today and we'll talk about installing Python and maybe we'll talk about a little bit more in chapter one. Okay, so we'll see you later today. Have a nice break. So we just read chapter one. I'm sorry? Uh, so today we just read chapter one. Yeah, this, this, this week we're covering chapter one. I think one day, Tuesday of next week, I'm going to try to be done with it. Um, I'm going to talk about installing Python and actually using a bit of Python today in lab and how it works and the, the interface there. Um, but yeah, I mean, you can read chapter two if you want, but it gets very complicated very quickly um, <laughs> if you want. But uh, yeah, look at chapter one, read bits of it. Um, it'll help you. All right, see you in lab. Okay, we'll see you later.